Good evening. The school board meeting of Tuesday, September 13th, 1994 is now called to order. The first item on the agenda is adjustments to agenda. Any board members have any adjustments? Seeing none, move on to approval of August. It should read 23rd, 1994 school board minutes. Are there any corrections? Two minutes. Okay, seeing none, the minutes stand approved. The next item is comments by high school representatives. Do we have a representative? Hello. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jen Cannell. Um, classes are starting to get underway and gain momentum at the high school. Extracurric extracurricular activities and clubs are beginning to meet. Um, I think today there were three or four first meetings of different activities. Um, and the sports season is in full, all the sports seasons are in full swing. The SAC has held its first meeting, at which time we discussed the new substance abuse policy, which encompasses all extracurricular activities as opposed to just sports teams. We also received an SAC meeting schedule for the first semester. Um, the only real change there from past years is that this year we're going to be having some evening meetings as well as meetings during the school day so that we can have less classes being interrupted. Um, the SAC retreat will be held on September 29th. One topic we'll be focusing on is improving communication between the SAC and student body, which hasn't been a real problem, but there has been the potential for a problem. So we've decided to make sure that it doesn't become one. Um, on the 23rd, we'll be holding a pep rally for all sports teams and, and clubs, which will follow up at 8 p.m. with the first dance of the year. And that whole day, we're going to be calling Spirit Day to try to improve school spirit. And that's just about all that I have. Can I ask you a question? Yep. Um, do, you, do you know if there are any plans to talk to the entire student body about the new drug policy, substance abuse policy? Um, I don't know. I, um, the, re the, re the reason that I'm asking is because when I was out on a walk last night, I actually talked to a high school student who was very confused about the policy, did not seem to have a clear picture of the policy, and I'm just wondering if it would be good to have the SAC or the administrators just walk, walk kids through the policies, because there were some serious misunderstandings that, that this student had, and I presume if this one did, probably others do too, about the scope of the policy. We can see what we can do to work on that. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Thank you. Okay. Oh, Charlie. Oh. It's probably, not a, question. Question it's probably not a quest for Jen, but more Mr. DeFusco. How often do you have assemblies? <laughs> I know you have a complicated schedule, and, but. We have assemblies as little as possible. <laughs> but that was uh, also one of the recommendations of your, of your right, accreditation. Right, right. We're looking to set up a couple during the course of each semester. Uh, we haven't set up that schedule yet, but uh, the opportunity for activities to be centered around specific topics so that we can bring the, bring the kids together uh, for that reason rather than just to have an assembly for that purpose. So That's the reason I yep. was asking is in reference to Anne's concern about how new policies are disseminated or administrative procedures to students. Okay. And one of the things we, we did, it was briefly discussed at the, uh, the opening day assembly as far as some of the new policies, but uh, the student you were talk to, talking to is absolutely right. We did, we did not go into specifics about it with the idea that it was sent to homes. Hopefully it was discussed with parents and uh, we will follow through with more dialogue on that. Uh, un that. Unfortunately, I, I have the feeling that a lot of parents may look at it and say, oh yeah, yeah, and not, you know, not talk <laughs> to their kid about it. And um, this student was, you know, I, I suggested that he come talk to you and he expressed, you know, some concern that if kids go up and ask questions, people might think that they have some, you know, some problem or something. Obviously, that's not the case. No, we need to address um, that and, yeah. you know, we'll try to work it a way that's, uh, you know, appropriate for the kids and for, and for us to, to do that. I think the better uh, alternative to, to an assembly with that would be to work in small, work with small classes right. or groups at a t t so that there can be some discussion with that as well as just uh, dissemination of information about right. it. So that's what we'll try to do. Right. Okay, thank you. Do we have any middle school representatives here tonight? Yeah. <coughs> Next month. Okay. All right, moving on to communications. 
Anybody have any communications? Charlie? I would just like to make a comment about our comments by high school and middle school representatives. I know there are school districts within Cumberland County who do not offer the opportunity of students coming to come before the board and to talk. And, and I, think, I think it's good that we get that interaction from our students directly to the board. And they feel, I think, a part of the process. I think it's very important. Anything else? Did you have any? Everything's in your package. Okay. I, I received, um, again, something from the MSMA about another opportunity for board members. I don't know if everybody got it about collective bargaining. Um, I'm, I'm sure Connie Brown probably, did you receive it? Did you receive a copy of it? Well, I'll pass it on to you. Um, this is not one I've attended, so I don't know if it's, um, you know, really worthwhile to attend this, but we are next month going to be having, um, you know, somebody come talk to us about collective bargaining, so that probably takes care of it. But anyway, that opportunity will be there. I'll pass this on to you if anybody's interested. And I'd also like to just thank all the building administrators for sending us the minutes of the team leader meetings and department head meetings. Those are extremely helpful. Um, to me, I'm sure everybody else finds themselves. So, so I know I, for one, appreciate the effort. Okay, uh, moving on to superintendent's report. Okay, well, we're going to start with the opening of school. And uh, I think we've had some comments about the opening of school from the high school point of view from uh, Jen. Uh, I know that uh, the high school is sort of a <laughs> island of calm, if you will, among the three buildings, but at the same time, I congratulate Rick and Randy and the staff and students for getting off and running. They've been very patient with some of the extra issues we've been dealing with, um, with uh, staff, other staff being part of the high school during the summer and so forth. Obviously, probably one of the biggest issues is to talk about how the project is going, what are some of the um, glitches that inevitably occur and what are we doing about it. I did include some information in your packet. Obviously, we are trying to communicate with the courier um, and from time to time notices uh, are sent out. Uh, I want to start by saying that we had an incident this morning that I found uh, really disheartening, but at the same time, we, one does have to put things into perspective. We have been very careful to communicate with our contractor, with our clerk of the works, about blasting. And in fact, we were told that we were finished with blasting except for one large piece that was left to be done. Um, and we were feeling that that was good because there, was a condi there is a condition on our plan from the planning board to notify um, the contractor is supposed to notify my office 48 hours in advance. And I turn around and notify the parent community 24 hours in advance. Or we work out some time like on the weekend when there is no possibility of uh, uh, student uh, being in the building. Um, what we discovered this morning is that a small uh, amount, as was described to me, a small amount of ledge was discovered um, in, on the middle school site, but away from the building. And it was determined without any conference with us that they could do it between 6 and 7. And thinking that that was a time when students were not on the grounds, they decided to go ahead and do it. Um, unfortunately, it took longer than they thought, and obviously there were, by 7.30 when they did finish, there were students arriving. Um, the place was, uh, there were signs and activity going on. We've certainly had some calls from people who are very understandably upset. I find it um, necessary to uh, anybody who happens to be listening to this, uh, we certainly uh, feel strongly that that was an unacceptable breach of our understanding with the contractor, and that conversation has gone on. They have apologized. They thought that, in fact, that that would be uh, acceptable because they knew it was a safe thing to do as far as the size of the blasting and so forth. In fact, it was done by our own Cape uh, resident, uh, Jimmy Murray, who was the subcontractor on that, and I'm sure he would never do anything that would be... Uh, you know, a danger to children. Nevertheless, we take seriously the fact that we were to be told and turn around and tell other people. And I do apologize to anybody who was aware of the situation. We do believe we've, we've uh, made our point clearly and people have apologized to us. Um, I, Sue um, Weatherby has been extremely proactive in going there and getting information and they acknowledge that fact. 
So it's something that I don't like to see happen, but anyway, shouldn't happen again. Um, the other difficulty that I want to point out is the fact that it's been a very dry summer. That there is a lot of dust, the loam uh, piles that are necessary to deal with the site work and so on. It's certainly been dried out, blowing around, et cetera. Um, we've had numerous conversations with the contractor trying to uh, see what can be done for dust control. We have stepped up our cleaning routines in the building. Uh, and on top of that, I have commissioned some air sampling to both find out what the nature of the dust might be um, and also uh, the degree. And we're, we're using uh, ASHRAE standards. I did put this out in your packet. And uh, so far, we find that things are, are certainly OK. I mean, some rooms seem to be worse than others, some days worse than others. But we have found ways of coping with it and controlling it and keeping it well within limits. Um, Frankly, I haven't had a lot of, in fact, I've had almost no complaints about it. I have had a few. Um, but in walking through the buildings myself and asking the principals, it does not seem to be um, a particularly obvious problem. And it will go away. Uh, they are right now moving that loam into position, seeding it. Um, the site has been inspected by the DEP, by all kinds of uh, other types of uh, organizations. And we are clearly doing everything we're supposed to do. I would appreciate it if you would let me know if you have any concerns, and we will continue to try to work on them. Um, other than that, I think that I would say not only congratulations to the uh, staff, the, t the children, <laughs> parents, uh, the whole community, insofar as they are involved. Uh, there's just an enormously cooperative atmosphere out there. Uh, I think it's going to take some of the sting out of this as people see the actual shape of the building. I mean, now that there's a good deal of the shell going up, uh, it will become more and more obvious that there is an end to this and that we will, in fact, um, you know, by a year from now, a lot of this pain will be over with. I also want to add that we uh, have walked through the buildings with the fire chief, and we have done uh, fire drills, and we have <coughs> checked to make sure that as some changes in the uh, construction are going on, that there are well-marked and well-understood fire exits. This is, of course, an important issue. We've had some questions about that one, too. Uh, all in all, uh, as I pointed out in our enrollment uh, sheet, we have just about the same number of students this year as we had last year, spread around a little more or less in some of the grades. Uh, if that means that we're stabilizing our enrollment, I think that's probably good news because obviously our buildings are not overly sized. The high school, now that we're using it for kindergarten, is well utilized. And with larger classes going in there, we know that we can fit them, but there would be some need for reconfiguring some rooms and so forth. Um, that, I think, would be the major issue uh, for the building, uh, opening a school, transportation, going reasonably well. We've had an enormous complication with three stops instead of two. Uh, I'm sure there are some individual glitches, but this is now our third, beginning of our third week of school, so I think those things are gradually working themselves out. So, comment? Can I ask Mr. Fustigo again about the parking, how it's working out with the students? Because I've heard, I have three children in the high school, so I'm <laughs> hearing a lot of feedback about the parking. Actually, it's going very well. Uh, Mr. Ray and I are trying to monitor that on, a, on the morning basis as well as during the day. And uh, we're finding the spots right now. We have enough spots. There's been some question as to why there are eight handicapped parking spots in, in, out of 60, 60 spaces. Um, and it, our concern is that snow removal and when there's snow on the building, we may, uh, around the building, it may limit some of the parking we have there. Right now it accommodates our needs both there and in the back. And one of the things with community services, we've asked Sue to utilize the, um, the bus area um, for also community services parking. And I think that's helped alleviate some of the pressure on the, on the new lot. It's worked out very well thus far. And uh, again, uh, I, I, I don't see any problems with that. So. Do you mean people using community services or staff parking? Staff parking staff. primarily, yeah. yeah. So. Also an observation of the new parking lot at the middle school and its utilization for after school activities by parents. It's 
Well, it certainly is handy to the fields, and it's Correct. better than having them drive on the fields and park. Obviously, that will all become uh, even more generous when the project is finished and the D-wing uh, is demolished because that space will substantially be parking also. At that point, we will then really get off Scott Dyer Road. And the access to those fields is so much easier than when my children were in the middle school and we had to truck through buildings and around buildings to get to a field that very accessible. I think that's working out very well. Um, Carla. I'm sorry. Can I ask Sue a transportation sure. related question? Um, maybe this would be a good opportunity, Sue, to explain maybe to some people who are um, watching how those, the three stops work again. Because I think there's a perception that, and maybe it's true, I really don't know, you can address it, that a lot of the Pond Cove buses are running much later this year. They definitely are. In fact, um, we're going to log the times that they come in tomorrow morning because some of them are getting in very close to 8.30. Mm -hmm. And since the kindergarten seems to be the last stop in a lot of cases, or in most cases sometimes, um, it's even closer to 8.35. So we seem to do, be doing fairly well in the afternoon um, in that we stagger where the buses go first. Some start at the kindergarten and then go from the kindergarten to the fourth grade and then from the fourth grade into the Pond Cove Circle. Those coming from the fourth grade can't negotiate the, to get into the circle to go to the kindergarten next, so they always have to go from the fourth grade um, to the Pond Cove School. And it is much slower. Um, when you add um, one additional stops, it used to take probably um, 12 to 15 minutes to get the children on buses at the Pond Cove site. Now that you're going to also the middle school, um, add on another seven or eight minutes. Okay, you come down to the kindergarten, and actually the kindergarten has a great system. They seem to be getting the children on the buses very smoothly, and it's easy to access and easy to exit from the kindergarten, but we definitely aren't leaving school grounds till pretty close to 320. So if parent thinks that their children are on the bus a long time in the afternoon, it's not nearly as long as they think. By the time we get everybody loaded and get moving, um, most depart about 3.20, and the buses are very full. In fact, this afternoon we had to leave two students behind because we had exceeded our maximum, and um, the first bus in came back, um, picked those children up, and took them home. We called their mom to notify them that they were in the front seat. It was easy to get them off, and they also were one of the first stops. So the buses are very full and moving slowly due to the additional stops. I have a question, Sue. Um, it seemed I picked up today at the fourth grade, and I got there about five minutes to three, and mm -hmm. there were kids already getting on buses and buses leaving. Are we letting the kids out earlier also? I think they start to organize the buses um, between 10 minutes of three and five minutes of three. That we're still working on the glitch of fourth grade particularly. Fourth grade does not have a sort of a calling system. We don't have a PA. We don't have any way of contacting them. So the individual portables sort of signal each other and say, ah, buses are coming. Let's, you know, let's line up. Mm -hmm. So we're still really, truly working out the glitches in that regard at that, on that site. Hopefully we'll have some kind of contact so that uh, they will know, you know, not to send the kids out and the buses will arrive at the, the predictable time. But we do, it would, wouldn't be fair to say the glitches are still seeing work done. Do, do they have clocks in those rooms? Clocks. I, I will tell you that in the middle school we have 17 <coughs> clocks that aren't working. And no, I'm talking, I'm, right, but I'm talking about in the portables. Are there, are there clocks in the portables? Some do and some don't. We're working on having the clocks put in. As a matter of fact, as we speak, they are being put up. We have boxes of them and being assembled in them. And do, they have intercoms in there now, too. They're still they? being hooked up. Oh, they're being hooked right. up. Okay, um, so that would presumably help that problem of releasing. Just, just so the that, that the public can understand that when we open school, um, everything had to be put back into the right. middle school and we had eight pages of maintenance requests and we are um, working, through working through them. Um, what we're trying to do is to address those of high priority first 
and um, we definitely will get things done. I, I would say we're halfway through the eight-page list. Um, things like clocks going up. We had to go out and purchase battery-operated clocks, and um, given um, all of the things that the bus drivers are doing in transporting food, et cetera, and how much effort it takes to get from one location to another, there, there isn't any downtime to accomplish a lot of these things. So they're slowly getting done, and we're prioritizing with those things we think most, in, most important. Thanks, Sue. So. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's another piece of business that isn't buildings. Um, you may recall last, at our last meeting, we uh, welcomed Wayne with a new hat as interim principal. And at that time, we said we would be looking in-house for our uh, position that, that uh, we asked you to establish as assistant to the special ed director because we, we felt that uh, by providing that assistance, we could uh, still rely on Wayne's knowledge of the uh, very special education programs, students, individual students, and so forth. And I'm happy to tell you tonight that Jackie Petrello, who is sitting in the back seat over there, um, has accepted that responsibility. Uh, we still have not yet, however, hired somebody to take her place. If any of you are not aware of Jackie, she works in the resource room, uh, or I really should say the student center room, I think would be a better way to describe it, study room at the high school and is still doing that, although working more and more with Wayne. And we anticipate being able to fill her position so that she will be able to um, work uh, pretty much full time in the other duties. Uh, Jackie, again, if any of you do not know her, has a, an extensive background in a variety of special education um, uh, assignments in various schools, has been with us here in the, uh, in, uh, before I was here, but I know doing a variety of uh, uh, jobs in the special ed department and has been now running the high school um, program, the chief person running the program for the last uh, four years, right? And this is Jackie Petrillo. Now, my understanding of our arrangement is that that was to be arranged by us in-house because this is a change of <coughs> assignment, not a asking you to vote on an appointment. So it's not a voting item, but we thought you would like to uh, not only know our decision, but um, meet Jackie. Any questions? Or I just know some people are going to really miss you at the high school, but we're lucky to have you in your new assignment. Um, can I just say a couple things about the opening of school? I, I just really need to pass on how many, um, I got so many phone calls from parents about how well the opening of school went and a lot of surprise from people that it went as well considering <laughs> everything that's going on. And also many, many compliments about the, um, the tours that were given right before school started. So I just want to compliment everybody who made it really go so smoothly um, for all the kids. Um, I also just have one question about the um, enrollment report, and that is something that I think I ask every year, and that is, do we do exit interviews? Have we started doing exit interviews of kids um, who are leaving our system, particularly when we know that they're not leaving the area but are going to private school in the area, just to find out what's on their mind? Have we started doing that yet? Well, they don't always give us an opportunity in the sense of, you know, when some people obviously move um, without necessarily taking that as part of it, and we may not know that they are moving. I know, uh, Sharon, you and I have had some conversations about that, and we do have some informal discussions from time to time. Um, I don't, I'm not aware, and actually the building principals, I think, would have to uh, correct me, but I'm not aware of any procedure we've been able to develop that that really does anything more than offer the opportunity. Um, I think we do get quite a lot of informal feedback. Uh, sometimes it's a uh, parent will call or will come in. Uh, sometimes it's uh, um, might even be a letter that has happened occasionally. But we have no formal process. I, I guess I would like to see one developed because it, to me it's the same kind of issue as trying to get an idea what happens to the kids after they leave our system after graduation. I think we should take any opportunity like that that we can to, you know, to get some feedback about why 
people are leaving the system. I mean, people can leave for a variety of reasons, and they're not, you know, always negative, or it doesn't mean the school's done anything wrong. But it just seems to me an opportunity that, that we should use. And I would think there could be a form that we send um, mm. to people. I mean, they have to request their records to go to another school, just a form letter we send out. Maybe people won't send them back, but maybe they would. And I think I, I personally know of people who would uh, welcome that opportunity, and I think it might give us information we could, we could use. Good point. That's it on that one. And in your packet, I put an athletic report from Keith Weatherby uh, from the high school. And you've had a chance to read it. Um, obviously, I think the highlights are the high involvement of the student body in athletics. Um, he makes some comparisons with some of the high schools in the region, and this percentage at least uh, is certainly one of the highest percentages of involvement. Uh, it's also included, of course, some dollar figures uh, for each of the sports and has uh, commented on the 1993-94 team records wins and losses um, with conference regional and state championships listed. So not only is there high participation, but apparently a great deal of success in those areas. Um, I know that um, I see also Andy Strout from middle school, um, and we talked about if are, were you going to address the middle school tonight, or did you prefer to do that next week? Uh, excuse me, next month. I do have the report here with me. I I thought that. It was supposed to be handed out to you just before this meeting. That was my assumption. Um, the reason it's, it's tardy is because with the asbestos removal and everything, I had everything locked into closets and everything, and I couldn't get into the school to complete it until all of us were in there. Um, if you'd like, I'll, I'll just go on to the next, next month's meeting, and I'll have it all in your packets and everything like that if you would like to. That's or fine. I could review, review it very quickly right here, whatever you would like. I, I always like to have things in writing in front of us so sure. we can, if we have any questions, we can respond. It might be easier okay. for you to. So. Sure. Okay, then I'll have that to you uh, the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Also in your packet, the 11. I have a question. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead, Charlie. <laughs> I had talked to Scott about uh, one of the line items. Um, Keith does break down the transportation costs per team, um, but that particular budget line item was last year um, was underspent and I noticed that his the amount is not much more than what he had for his 93 94 is not much higher than what he was for 92 93 have we looked at have you had a chance to look at those costs with him okay. thank you okay um, this was my first athletic report that I'd ever received, and I was very um, impressed with some of the facts that Keith had stated, and I thought I would just uh, read them to you. That we have, as a school, um, we are holding six state championships in boys' soccer and golf, girls' swimming, girls' and boys' tennis and lacrosse, one state runner-up, four Western Maine regional championships, seven Western Maine conference championships that 70% of our students are involved in athletics, and that this represents 6% of our budget. Um, and I, I thought we should be real proud of what we've done here. Absolutely. The, um, it's interesting, too, when he compares it nationally with <coughs> participation. I was a little surprised to see a 40% figure mm -hmm. Uh, as a national average, somehow I had the impression that there was a higher percentage of student involvement in ath athletics. So um, I don't know what that means exactly, but I think it certainly says that for a small school system, we're, we're doing all right. Um, moving on, I put a notice in your packet on Community Services Advisory Commission that comes from Debbie Lane, um, our town clerk, who Oh, excuse me, I skipped one. I'll finish this one, then go back. The, um, 
Uh, advisory Commission is not an action item. It's simply reminding you uh, and reminding anybody uh, interested that the time is coming for citizen participation on various boards. Community services is a uh, sort of a subsidiary of the school board or the school department, and uh, this is just a notice for anybody interested. That advisory board uh, will be, there will be at least a couple of vacancies coming due, and Debbie Lane as town clerk wanted to make sure that we reminded people they're interested to register with her uh, or with Sue, I guess. So you can certainly uh, go tell the director if you're interested, too, not just the clerk. Um, then going back, I sorry, I did skip the 11th grade MEA, and you have that in your packet. <coughs> um, it's a uh, certainly the MEAs are a statewide test at the 11th grade level. If you look at state comparisons, and since this is a statewide test, that's really basically what you take into consideration with the results. Cape High School does, in fact, almost always come out on the top, uh, small percentage at top uh, in the state. Um, frankly, that does have something to do with our large proportion of students who take college preparatory classes. Uh, we've had conversations about that in other board meetings on other years, but for those of you who are new on the board, um, that is a factor uh, in the way in which these things are set up and how they compare across the state. They certainly don't want to take anything away from students who are scoring in the top percentile, but just as a point of information, when you look at the fourth grade <coughs> scores or even the eighth grade scores, you need to be aware that that uh, is a factor at the high school level. Uh, I did not see anything particularly remarkable or different from what we've seen in the past. For those people who are watching who do not uh, have this in front of you, 400 is the best score you can get. And all of our scores are either 400 or 385, which statistically in a test of this nature is simply not significant. Having looked at these for five years, <laughs> <laughs> I, I see in the 11th grade our gender gap is almost closed on many. I know it's math and science are pretty much for boys and girls is about the same. Mm -hmm. And that the boy, and that as far as reading and writing, that it's closing much closer. One other observation uh, it was interesting to look at students who took the MEA in this district and how they scored on the 11th grade MEA and students who moved into this district who didn't take the MEA in the eighth grade. Just in, we're talking about the exit interview. It's interesting that the quality of student that moves into this community seems to score 400 right across the board. Mm. Any other comments, questions? Okay. okay. Um, Moving on. The Last item on my report is to um, discuss the results of a student survey on drug and alcohol use on Cape Elizabeth Middle School and High School students. Um, I can also tell you that um, since our packets are public information, I've already had a call from the reporter in the Portland paper, so I would expect to see a discussion of this issue um, shortly. Uh, we realized, of course, when we did a survey like this, that um, it would be information that some people will find uh, alarming. Some, I don't think anybody can feel that is reassuring. Um, this is part of a series of steps that the school department has taken to try to understand what, in fact, we are dealing with and what are the issues of drug alcohol use among our, our students. Again, for anybody who is not familiar with this, um, the survey was an anonymous uh, survey given to students from grade 6 through 11. And the, uh, uh, the answers have been screened to uh, show a variety of factors, um, how much is used, what kind of stimulant is used, what kind. Um, where the setting where stimulants are used. Uh, and before going into any of the details and discussing this, I just want to say that this is also part of a community 
uh, response and concern, which uh, didn't exactly start with the LSD situation, but it's certainly been heightened, I think, in the last year or so in our concern that we are doing what we should be doing. Uh, in fact, I've had a meeting with the police chief, uh, with one of our town councilors, Jeannie Ginn Marvin. Uh, we've discussed this with, um, uh, with Michael McGovern, our town manager, um, and we are in the process of setting up or building on the committee that was meeting last spring, uh, a representative group of uh, any organization in the, in the town that's dealing with um, uh, issues of drug and alcohol use. And uh, we've decided that that will be not a policy-making or decision-making board, but a communication group. The first meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, November 9th. And uh, we, you'll have more information on that as we go forward. But uh, so we would certainly want to have this discussion in the framework that it is a community issue, not just a school issue. Um, and that I think as we go forward with specific numbers and issues, we want to keep that in mind. Charlie. Just an observation on the percentage that were surveyed. You know, statistically, I think it's a good percentage. But what I think alarmed me was the number of 10th graders that participated in relationship to the other grades. It was like 23% participation versus 93 and 60% for the other two high school grades and almost 92% plus for the middle school. Is there some reason? Yes. Right. Can you address that? Um, we attempted to, to give the surveys uh, in a forum in which the, it, it was not just a classroom setting, fill out these surveys and complete them. We attempted to uh, utilize the survey in part of our drug and alcohol education. The freshman surveys were completed during our freshman retreat. The sophomore surveys were planned to be issued out during our sophomore retreat, which is, was only a one-day situation. Because of the schedule in a newness to the sophomore retreat day, they did not have time to complete that. With that in mind, we tried to uh, get as many as we could through the phys ed classes. We had a deadline to mail the, uh, the surveys out. And that's why, Charlie, we did not, the, the uh, sophomore, it wasn't a case of students refusing to, to uh, fill out the surveys. We just didn't use, have the avenue to do that, whereas the, uh, the juniors were also surveyed through Andrea Kerr's health curriculum. So we try, again, it was focused on an educational component, not simply, here's a survey we'd like you to fill out. And in that, we missed, we really missed the boat with the sophomores because we had planned to do it at the retreat and did not. Whose choice to exclude the seniors? It was pretty much our concern that with the results that we had, I'd say it was my choice. Um, our concern was with the results, what we were going to do with them. And with the seniors having been out, I mean, the impact of those results hopefully will affect us this year. And feel the, the idea that seniors would no longer be here, we, we wouldn't have the impact of uh, having some input uh, into some of the discussions that would, would transpire from that. Thank you. Are, are we going to run through the, the summaries? Um, well, this clearly there are pages of data right and one of the uh, I do think uh, uh, Rick and whoever else worked on the summary the buff colored summary that you have because this was an attempt to uh, introduce this kind of overwhelming mass of data in some form that that we can focus on um, again and I realize this is a struggle when you're in a meeting like this we have no capacity to throw all these things on an overhead or something of that sort uh, but I want to, uh, and I think I did not mention this, we have a parent coalition meeting scheduled for this coming Monday. And that will be, help me out, is that 7 or 7.30? 7.30. 7, seven o'clock in the cafeteria at the high school. Whoops, 7.30. 7.30 at the cafeteria in the high school. And we uh, have asked Chris Trout to, um, to be the presenter that night, and uh, he has is well aware that we are sharing this information at this board meeting, and we would invite parents to come. We will have this handout ready for them. We will make sure that people do have these figures so they can sit there and absorb them, and you know, not just have to listen to to things. Um, where do you want to start? Well, it is difficult. Um, you know, with the, with the number of figures here. I guess one thing I would like to suggest is if we could make 
some copies both of the of the large surveys, the complete surveys, because you know while they're redundant to reports on on the two schools, I, I found them very interesting, and um, they had some information in them that obviously you can't cover in a summary. Um, but I, I would hope we could make them available maybe through your office even prior to that meeting. I'm sure there are going to be people who are hearing this tonight, you know, who are going to be interested in seeing that, and, and I think they should be able to see this, this summary also. Um, Charlie? No, I agree. The more that you can disseminate this information out, I think having been a member of the community team, and it came to a point where they were floundering because it became more than a school issue. It was actually a community and family issue, and how do you outreach and get to that? And, and I think they floundered and it kind of dispersed, and I think the Cape Coalition picked up because they started to see problems much earlier, and, and the only way you're going to address those problems is you have to start earlier. And I, and I, I really would uh, hope that the paper does do an article on this, because I think mm -hmm. the community needs yeah, to yeah. get this information. Mm -hmm. And these, this is from the mouths of children and students in our system, and mm -hmm. I think they're being quite honest, well, very I, honest with their results. Yeah, I think w one of the things that I, that I really liked about this study was how they tried to screen out kids who were exaggerating with the, you know, by a variety of methods so that I think these are pretty true figures and um, they certainly are sobering. And the thing that I'd, I'd like to stress is that, um, you know, here we have, we have uh, you know, just for, for instance, it says that six, grade Cape Elizabeth students, 48% of them have um, tried alcohol, um, and 6% have been drunk, claimed to be. Um, by, by eighth grade, it's 76% um, have tried alcohol. That's compared to a national average of 67%. That's a little sober, not to make a pun out of it. Um, the thing that I think we need to keep in mind about these numbers is that this is, by and large, not a school problem. It is based outside of school. Obviously, it affects school. There are some kids who, you know, have, who say they have used at school or come to school um, impaired um, or use uh, substances at school. But by and large, most of the use is at home, at parties, with friends. And so this is so clearly not just a school issue. And I'd like to, you know, after we get this information out to the public, I'd like to see if we can't change the focus from the schools being the ones who are supposed to educate kids, because we have had many education programs in place from second grade on. And what we've actually seen is the average age of first use according to this survey, um, has gone down, not, not up. Um, for instance, the average age of first use for in, among the 11th graders for being drunk was 14.3. For, for our last year's 8th graders, is 12.4. For inhalants um, in the 11th graders, 14.8. For the 8th graders, it's 11.1. So clearly, the schools can't do this all alone. Um, these parents, we've somehow got to, to get the emphasis back on, you know, parents have got to be educated, and they've got to do a better job of educating their kids. Um, the schools can really only be responsible for what happens during school, and that should be our primary focus. And I'd like to see us work um, very vigorously with the Cape Coalition to kind of turn our efforts around to reaching parents at an age where, you know, they may actually sit up and listen, say fourth, fourth grade probably, fifth grade, and educating them to talk to their kids. And obviously we'd still have to have some things done in school, but I think we've got to put the responsibility back on the parents um, to help their individual children because this is a really dismal picture we're seeing. So, I hope that's something that will be discussed um, at the meeting with, with Chris Trout. It's certainly the, a good, good place to start. And, and these are health issues, too. I mean, when you look at the, especially the high school ages, the, just the increase in cigarette smoking, the average is right. know, 60 to 70%. And, and I had a discussion with a former board member who 
who totally disagreed with this. He just thought that was, but this is bearing in mind. Right, and, and Keith Weatherby mentioned it in his athletic report, uh, the substance abuse problem and particularly the smoking. And these are health issue. issues. You know, yeah. you take, coupled with the amount of alcohol, the high percentage of alcohol participation, I mean, we have, we have addicts at a very young age. Right. Um, I would like to say that if this survey is repeated, that I really would recommend that you do um, survey high school seniors simply to give yourself the information if there is an even greater increase or decrease in high school seniors, even though those people will have graduated and moved on by the time you get the results, how you work with any current high school seniors about these issues, um, it might be helpful to know that. Carla? I'd be interested in that uh, also, simply for the reason that um, as I read these reports, I was really distressed by the 11th grade numbers, which in many instances really seemed to skyrocket. They were, across the board, the worst percentages. And it would be interesting to see when these 11th graders become 12th graders, does it drop off? or stay the same or get better. It might be important to um, just, again, I'm sensitive to the fact that people are listening uh, without this in front of them. Uh, I think the questions on where Cape Elizabeth, Elizabeth students have used alcohol, it happens to be the one I'm looking at, there's similar kinds of things in the report for um, regular drugs and so on, or other kinds of drugs. Um, let's just take for purposes of sharing with the public the 11th grade, since you just mentioned it, um, where Cape Elizabeth students have used alcohol on the way to school, 2%, during school hours at school, 8%, during school hours away from school, 10%, right after school, 26%, at school events, 41%, at parties, 71%. At night with friends, 67%. While driving around, 16%. At home, parents knew, 24%. At home, parents didn't know, 47%. When you look at things like that, the issues that are raised uh, as far as this being primarily a school problem is very, very uh, obvious. It is not just a school problem. It is a lifestyle problem, or uh, and certainly is um, the percentages alone, uh, and they, they're consistent right through, although those are the largest numbers for all the other groups. Um, I've been talking to the administrators about what do we think the school events are. Uh, our suspicion is uh, athletic events, um, people in the stands or in the bleachers or on the sidelines. Um, it's a situation that we don't have enough staff to totally monitor, but I assume that that's part of it. And, and certainly at the high school level, we, have, we know we've had problems with dances, try to monitor that and so forth. Not sure what other school events, but that is certainly an issue that given our policies we are concerned about and want to work on. Um, the right after school at 26 percent, we don't know exactly where that is. I think in some of the discussions we may find out. Uh, but it is after school, not during school, and I don't know where, how to sort that one out particularly. Um, of all those percentages, the direct school percentage and it's bad enough, I mean, 8% of our students using some kind of alcohol in some form during school is totally unacceptable. On the other hand, um, that is far, you know, just trying to figure out where is this happening and what is going on here. Um, it is not that uh, uh, issue on school grounds is certainly not the overwhelming issue here. And you see 67% and 71% at parties and at night with friends, I think you get a pretty strong picture here where this is going on. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to note on that same chart that Connie was reading that the percentage of sixth graders who use alcohol at home with the parents knowing was 23%, and which is just about the same as 11th graders, which is 24%. 
And I guess to me that's shocking that parents, 23% of sixth graders would use alcohol at home with their parents knowing about it. And I guess that reinforces the issue or the point Anne made that um, I really look at this as a baseline of where we are now and that the school's role is really going to be to facilitate the um, CAPE coalition and to do programs for um, parents with their kids after school and things like that, that the programs that we have, although maybe good, it's probably not enough. And I really see that we need to intervene probably, you know, below sixth grade, which really means about the fourth grade level, and um, start there and really do something in, in conjunction with the parents. Um, and since I am also very concerned with the time that's taken away with ac uh, academics at school, that it really needs to be done through community services with an after-school program that we really actively get involved in those things. I just, I, I just want to make one clarification on some of the things that we've been saying. This is the problem of trying to talk about statistics and people don't have them in front of them. When we're giving these statistics of where people have used them, we're not talking about the entire student body. We're talking about the people who have said they have used drugs. Okay, so it's very important to make that clear. And just to, just to clarify, for the 11th grade, unfortunately, it's not that pretty a picture still. <laughs> Only 27.6 um, have negligible or no use of, uh, of drugs, um, but at, at sixth grade, it's 78.2. So we're talking about the percentage of that, that, that other group. But still, obviously, we're talking about kids who are 11 years old in sixth grade, and um, that's pretty sad. They don't define tried either, <clears throat> the tried alcohol. It could have been a sip, or well, it could have been. It, well, okay. The sixth grader would probably. Yeah, and they that. would have said, "Yeah, I tried it." Yeah. I don't know. But I don't. I, you know, I, I think the we should look at the big picture, and and it's not it's not a it's not a good picture for me as a parent actually of a sixth grader. I'm I'm extremely alarmed, and um, while I know there've been all these programs going on in the school, I wonder you know how much lasting value they really have when you see, it's not in our summary, but in the big report there's a statistic of, you know, sixth graders saying, will you ever, you mm. know, use, and 80% say no, but you see what happens, um, you know, pretty soon afterwards, and it's because, you know, in sixth grade, you might be in the bubble of, yes, you know, this, this sounds great, sounds like the right thing to do, and then you get into peer pressure, and, you know, family things have, have a lot more to do with whether kids um, are using than the school issues, so I th really think we need to work hard on educating the parents and, and putting the responsibility back on the parents that this is a family issue. The school cannot solve this problem for families. What the school can do is provide a safe environment for all kids. Bill, do you want to speak? Sure. Uh, I'm Bill Linnell on the council, for anyone that doesn't know. Um, I just had a couple of thoughts on this. Because um, I had talked to some uh, substance abuse counselors uh, when I was coaching before, and the subject, it comes up a lot. And uh, that uh, one particular counselor uh, made some observations that are consistent with what you're saying tonight, that this is a community problem, and uh, that it's not fair to... Um, uh, you know, just say all oh, the you know the schools need to do something about this and so forth, and that's what I'm hearing tonight. And what I'm wondering is how you all would feel about um, the council uh, really uh, picking up the ball on this issue, because uh, again, if it's a if it's a community issue, I wonder if the the, the town council uh, should. Uh, uh, exercise some initiative and uh, carry the ball on this. And I just wonder if you, if you have any thoughts on that off the... Well, I just wanted to comment that I had, uh, obviously, we, Janie Ginmarvin from the council also has uh, met with some of us. We've had actually a couple of meetings where we've been sharing information and out of that's coming the idea of this town-wide group, I don't think it has a name exactly, but the 
Uh, David Pickering has written a, um, a draft's mission statement of policy, and the idea is to um, help those agencies, whether they're town or businesses perhaps in, in the town, to come together in some regular specified way for communication and talk about education, um, intervention, and enforcement. And you will be hearing more about that. Um, but we appreciate, I certainly right. want to speak for the school departments, and we appreciate your interest. Right. Because I'm, I'm you know, what I'm hearing tonight is uh, that it's, gee, this is a community problem. And so, but it's the school board that's talking about it. And, and uh, that's good. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just wondering if, uh, if it's a community problem, that means uh, it's a bigger picture. And uh, uh, now I understand that there's another survey that some communities have done, uh, have opted for in addition to surveying students, of surveying parents. And, and I'm wondering if that's something that we should do also to survey parents' attitudes. Do you know? I understand that, for example, the town of Falmouth, uh, uh, I think it was Falmouth, uh, in addition to surveying the kids, they surveyed the parents. And they found that, yeah, a big part of the problem does start back at home. And I know that's consistent with what uh, uh, last year I attended a presentation put on by uh, South Portland uh, Police Department uh, in uh, the South Portland school system. And they, they found that uh, a lot of this, uh, uh, a lot of this uh, started at home. And uh, uh, I think he's something like over 50 percent. Uh, typically, and I'm not just talking about South Portland or Cape Elizabeth, but typically 50% of the time uh, the, these kids uh, uh, are, are, have access to uh, uh, these things at home. And, uh, and, and that certainly is part of the problem. And uh, yeah, uh, Charles? I, I know when I was on the community team that they did try to attempt a survey of, of the community and it was negligible response. So it was really hard to get mm -hmm. an aspect of, of what the community really felt was, was a problem. Those people who were most concerned were those who got active in the community team, but that was a small percentage of, of parents. We did have a conversation as part of the preliminary conversation about um, doing this survey. Uh, trying to understand what might be the purposes and, um, and what, what some of the pros and cons and so forth and so on. Uh, it was my strong understanding from that meeting that the majority of people there felt that the only kind of survey which might yield some useful data uh, in conjunction with this one is what do parents think their students are doing. In other words, if we have a self-report from students saying certain things, and if there had been some way in which we could ask parents, well, what do you think your son or daughter is doing, all anonymous, of course, and then look at the results, we thought that might give us some kind of a reality check. Do, in fact, parents have a more trusting view than perhaps they might have? Uh, other than that, that was the conversation that we've had so far. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It seems to be the... Uh the general feeling of the town that it's not as bad in Cape Elizabeth as it is in other areas of the country. Uh, and this survey clearly indicates that that's not the case at all. The, you know, just the, the eighth graders, uh, Cape Elizabeth eighth graders, 76% have tried alcohol, where in the national average it's at 67%. Uh, so I, whatever we can do between the school board, the town council, and, and any other groups to get that message out, I, I'm, I think could help the situation. Right. Thank you. I would only make one comment about the 12th grade. I think you'd find the numbers about equal to what the 11th grade are. Yeah. And that's from personal observation, of having 11th grader last year running around with 12th graders. Yeah. That's all I'll say. I would encourage uh, ne next time around uh, surveying 12th graders also. I mean, it seems to me that it's, uh, it's, it's obvious that uh, uh, if when one gets a little older and, and closer to the uh, the legal age of, of some of these uh, substances that uh, that uh, that's got to be part of the problem and certainly to understand the problem I, I think that would be a good idea next time I actually I, I like the uh, 
I think it's Portland, South Portland, uh, new enforcement uh, teams that are going into uh, small shops. Yes. Mm, yeah. yeah. Because I think I don't think a lot of this is coming out of the homes. I think it's being supplied by people who either can buy it for them. I think it's probably uh, both. both. I think both, the survey think also shows it is, it's so. both. Yeah, I think that parents are, are tending not to look for it either. Well, well, part of it is again the as as far as I can see, as as the parent of a sixth grader, I've had no education, you know, geared to me. Mm -hmm. um, I I really didn't. I only knew from you know hearing vague rumors about the inhalant issue, and um, you know that's a problem with the younger kids because it's so accessible. I mean, there are all these inhalants in your house, um, and if you know, it's the kind of thing that I think that's that's a place where the school has a role of informing parents not to you know create hysteria, but to create an awareness of what you know what's going on with these kids. Um, but I, you know, I think we need to start at you know, and at an age when parents really start getting getting concerned about it, um, and I and I think that's probably around fourth grade. I think you know, they're probably maybe you'd like to give us some funding for some. <laughs> hey, I, well, I'll tell you. Um, I know that uh, I understand that in Yarmouth, for example, the community has hired a full-time substance abuse counselor, and they've done it out of the municipal budget. Um, I think it'd be money well spent, and uh, uh, I, uh, that's one area that uh, I wouldn't mind spending a little more money, and it, we certainly seem to have a problem there. Um, and again, I, I, it, to me it's awkward for, uh, for to, to say that um, it's a community problem if the community isn't willing to solve it to, or, or to work towards it as a and, and, and take some leadership because I don't want to. I don't want to be sitting here a year from now and people saying, "Well, what are the statistics now?" and and well, they haven't got that better. And, and, and what is the what is the community leadership? What has the council done about it? Well, you know, we've kind of left it up to the school board, and then the school board says, "Well, it's you know, it's a community problem. Uh, uh, you know, most of this is not happening in school. There's certainly a lot. Uh, the majority of it is certainly outside of school." And so uh, I think we, we really need to get together on that and, uh, uh, and, and look at ways that uh, to, to consider it and, and actively, um, uh, actively pursue it from a community uh, perspective. Well, I, I certainly appreciate your, your uh, cooperative spirit. I, I, I just want to make sure that people understand I wasn't trying to imply that the school had no uh, you know, responsibility or role here because it's a community oh. problem. I'm, I'm just no, no. suggesting it may be appropriate for the school to take a hard look at what we're doing in the school and think this may not be working that well, not because we haven't tried, but because well, we're not, we don't have the right focus. Well, I think it's the nature of the problem. I mean, uh, from your own statistics, most of it isn't happening in school. And so we why should we expect the schools we... to solve the whole problem? Right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Bill. Um, Carla? Yeah, I wanted to say that um, <clears throat> while I also agree with what you said very early on, that this is probably a very truthful survey and that they did try to weed out exaggerated answers, one thing I wouldn't mind some follow-up on, if it's at all possible, is the figures on um, the category was availability of drugs, um, which percentages they thought were either fairly easy or very easy to get. And I was really truly shocked at some of these numbers where you have a quarter of the eighth graders saying that they think it's very easy to get heroin that's their perception it's a perceived availability uh -huh. as i as i read it that's what they perceive that it is but those numbers were tremendously high all across the board the perceived availability and i wonder what's behind that perception why do they think it's going to be so easy to, to go get heroin or pcp or Probably Some because other it's other easy to get the other things. So they probably think if they wanted to, they, they could, could they could get it. Maybe they can. May I say something? I wasn't surprised at, at these results, and, and I'm trying to read this with um, the eye of a skeptic, I guess, that saying that maybe some of the kids thought this was um, just an exercise that they didn't have to give much attention to, and a lot of the students probably paid took very took this uh, survey very seriously. But I don't think the numbers were alarming. I think they were pretty much on the mark because 
of being on middle school parents and being in the parent forum over the past few years, this has been a, an issue that they have struggled with year in and year out. And the parent coalition has come forth and has been a rebirth of that group. And, and I think if people will come to the meeting on Monday night with Chris Trout, he helped uh, write the substance abuse policy for the high school this year. I, I think it would be very helpful. And if it is a community issue, there are avenues in the community already established that could be better used. Um, and maybe we need to get together and really talk about these issues. I commend um, Rick DeFusco on that policy. I have some questions about some of the parts of it. But I think it is a strong beginning, and it's consistent. And I would like to see a policy that would go fourth grade through senior year and have it clearly stated to the students. And I, and I do think, Rick, that we need to say to the students clearly what this policy states so that there is not a misunderstanding and that it is not all up to the parents to read this policy because I know that that's not happening. Um, but the, the very conclusion of this policy says exactly what we said here. That preventing drug use and limiting the damage done by alcohol and drugs will require a concerted effort by the whole community. <coughs> that this shows that the school cannot deal with the problem alone, and that schools, parents, and community leaders and youth need to be involved. And that's our charge. And I think we have addressed it um, on some levels, or at least are trying to, and that we all need to um, gather together and, and work towards a conclusion with it. Can, can I just ask a question? My understanding uh, um, from reading this summary is that this is being, this policy at the high school policy is being implemented at the middle school as well? Yes. Has, that hasn't been disseminated to parents as yet, though? Um, no, because we wrote it in our student handbook. And right now, that's still at the printers. And when it comes back, we intend to have assemblies with each grade level to go over the handbook. That's certainly one of the procedures we'll go over. I think it would be very, very important, um, again, to not just leave it in the handbook, to, but to get this home to the, to the parents. Because we have a responsibility to make it you know, somewhat easy for them to read it. Uh, they're not all going to read it, but I think, I think this is um, a substantial and positive change. But I, I don't want anybody to be able to accuse us of not having let them know. And I think you know, maybe in the next newsletter, um, to the parents, it would be a very good idea to send this home because it is, it sends the message. Bill? Uh, I want to say that, that that study, to me, it is alarming. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not complete. I, I'm, I was somewhat surprised by it. I think it, it is alarming. Uh, uh, the, the average, it puts us up there uh, perhaps slightly higher than the national average. Um, to me, whether we're a point or two above or below the na national average isn't all that significant to me. It, 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 but it tells me it, it is alarming. And I'll tell you, a parent came up to me last fall and said, my kid did seven hits of acid uh, last Friday night and didn't know what to do. Um, same day, uh, I was going for a walk, and I, I just uh, got, was in a conversation with a parent, and, and uh, he said, "Well, yeah, my stepkids, yeah, I, you know, I think they're, I think they're smoking pot and drinking. Uh, you know, I don't really know what to do about it. I'm the step parent. Uh, I didn't, he, he didn't really want to be the heavy on it, um, and just, uh, uh, I, I do think it's a real serious." Uh, problem. I, I think we should be alarmed about it. And uh, I think that we, we do have to uh, really uh, be constructive and, and put our heads together. And I am, uh, um, some of the things that are in place, I don't, I don't think we should be reluctant to, to, to really grab the, the bull by the horns on this issue. Uh, uh, if, if, if we need to uh, do something a little bold and innovative, such as they've done in Yarmouth. Uh, I, I really think uh, we, we shouldn't waste uh, a lot of time doing it and, and not, not be hesitant. I mean, this is not, I, I just don't think uh, this is anything to, uh, um, 
this is not the time uh, to be um, uh, shy about uh, about doing something. And I know that uh, uh, some people. Uh, uh, I mean, this is not something we we like to think about. We we don't like. I mean, we like to think about uh, the Cape kids that are. Uh, champion, state champions in, in six sports, and uh, and we should be proud of that them. And at the same time, we I, I think we really need to uh, ad address this. And and uh, so I I just hope that or encourage the support from the uh, from the school board, and and I will uh, uh, talk to the town council about it, and and. Uh, uh, I think we, we really need to be aggressive in, in addressing this problem. Thank you. Bill, uh, just so you know, this gives me a chance to plug um, the, the coalition's other program, which is also co-sponsored by Community Services, um, for those people who didn't know what to do about those, <laughs> those things. Um, starting on September 29th, for five weeks, um, someone from day one, Louise Tate, uh, we'll be running a workshop on parents are important people and it's it's just about those issues about communicating with your kids and, and all the all those kinds of issues um, you know for $25 per family that's a pretty that's a pretty good deal um, and I think Sue might want to say something about it but I, you know there are things going on it's not that that these issues are aren't being addressed but you know certainly getting a survey like this focuses your attention very strongly and makes you reevaluate um, what you're doing. There are a lot of good programs in place, but clearly, you know, we need to redouble our <coughs> efforts. So. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Just so parents know, we will be doing those registrations on Thursday night, and we have delayed the start of that course oh. by one week due to the high school open house. So that will start October 5th, and we'll extend it one week on the other end. Um, we'll have a sign up to that effect at open house, but if they're listening, um, it will not conflict. We'll just delay the start by one week. Thanks, so. Okay. All right. Time to move on. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. Come on. <laughs> I wasn't really prepared to talk. Uh, my name is Jim Cupel. I'm president of Commonwealth Research, and and I'm I'm the the group that the Kate Coalition met with last year to discuss the possibility of doing a survey of parents to tie it out to the survey that you've got in front of you. And uh, those discussions are still going forward. And uh, you know, we're, we're waiting for this Cape Coalition meeting next, next week to really see where to take the next step. But, but the counselor is right in the sense that it's, it's important to establish a baseline out in the community of parents and, and others. Uh, our firm has, has done that in a variety of, of counties and statewide. You can get positive readings that are accurate, give and take uh, some sampling errors, so that is possible. Uh, and that was just to kind of reinforce what you were saying, that things are kind of moving along. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the update. In summary, I would just say that I've been involved in schools for 30 odd years. 30 in years, not odd years. Excuse me. <laughs> Slightly more than 30 years. <laughs> and that the, um, unfortunately, for probably 28 of those years, I have been as first a junior high teacher, a high school teacher, a junior high principal, um, and obviously to some degree as a superintendent. I have been dismayed at what has happened in our society with our young people. This is only part of. I'm afraid a whole network pastiche, if you will, of problems that impact children and young people. Um, and in discussing these statistics, there clearly is a continuum. Some youngsters are doing what people have kind of gotten comfortable with is experimentation, but I don't think there is a parent in the world that's comfortable with a teenager risking his health, her health, uh, risking to say nothing of, of physical health, what kind of mental readiness for somebody who should be spending a lot of active time studying, preparing themselves. And it is certainly true that the younger these things are um, involved, that they're involved with it, 
There's plenty of evidence. It's getting tied to a drug culture, getting tied to um, some kind of despondency, et cetera. And the fact that, um, that this kind of report, one of the things that bothers, among other things, the whole thing bothers me, but uh, I fear that we may have a tradition of celebrating our sports events with teenage parties. And I think that would be tragic if we are champions and if we are, in fact, involved with high enrollment and high participation in sports, to think that those have to be celebrated in parties uh, that include alcohol and drugs. I think that's something that this community needs to think about, and we will certainly try to help. Okay. Moving on to school board subcommittees and reports. The first is finance subcommittee. Charlie? Uh, the finance subcommittee met at 6.30 before our, our school board meeting this evening. Um, we essentially looked at three, three items on our agenda. We signed the warrants. Uh, we re reviewed some main state retirement letters pertaining to teacher contract um, commitments of our current contract. And we listened to a presentation by Steve Etzel on capital assets and maintenance plan along with a short presentation by Dan Reed, our maintenance supervisor, in looking at a creation of our five year to five to 20 year maintenance and capital improvement plan that the Cape Elizabeth School System is undertaking. Okay, moving on to school building committee. Connie, would you mind summarizing our last meeting? Well, at our last meeting, uh, the major piece of business was the um, school committee uh, voting to accept the conditions of the, um, well, actually, the school, the school board had voted to accept the conditions of funding alternates uh, that the town council had actually suggested and then voted on and passed. And the piece of business for the building committee was to vote to include um, the Allied Arts Wing into the project uh, so that actually the vote taken there was to include four alternates, the three that have been discussed in the um, town council and your own school board discussion of last month. Uh, just for reminders, that's the Allied Arts Wing, the community parking lot, and the garage, or not really a garage, but really storage shed at the uh, bus site. Uh, and uh, the committee added a fourth alternate, which was uh, carpeting in the cafeteria. It's not not carpeting in the sense it's carpeting here. It's a sort of uh, softer composition floor, uh, which we thought was important for sound purposes. So that action is now taken. The contractor has been notified, and all of those pieces have moved forward. Other than that, there was some discussion about um, colors. I think we had a subcommittee appointed on choice of colors. I'd be happy to talk about that one. <laughs> <laughs> and I was not on it. So. The, the subcommittee on colors uh, includes <laughs> Charlie, myself, Beth, Courier, um, Ann Caliandro, a teacher at Pond Cove, <clears throat> excuse me, Susie Tarian, the art teacher at the middle school, and then the architect and their interior designer was there. Have I forgotten anybody? I don't mm -hmm. think so. Uh, we met last week. Um, they, they came to us with some proposals for colors for, for Pond Cove, and we had a lively discussion about the colors, but I think, I think things are moving along pretty well. I won't say what they are because things are not, you know, set in <laughs> stone yet by any means, but we're going to meet again this Thursday um, to discuss the middle school. Um, that may be somewhat more contentious, I think, the colors, but uh, anyway, I'm sure we'll come to a good recommendation to bring to the building committee at, at um, our next scheduled meeting, which is actually September 22nd. I think there was so. consensus on colors. It was more design. Oh, consensus, <laughs> consensus, consensus on, on colors, colors, but not correct. design. But middle, middle school, I don't think the well, we have consensus got to on there, colors. Though. Right. <laughs> we'll see. OK, I'm moving on to the we'll policy see. subcommittee. Beth? Um, I just wanted to say the policy subcommittee met on um, Wednesday, September 7th at 9.30 in the morning. We continued our uh, review of the policy manual. Um, there will be first readings under new business of um, a number of policies that had changes in them. Um, 
I think at this point, though, I can say the ones we reviewed and accepted as they are. Um, we reviewed and accepted IKB homework, IKAB student progress reports to parents, JECB admission of non-resident students, JFCB smoking by students. Um, they are all policies that um, either were um, last looked at in the 1970s or the 1980s, and we looked at them again and um, accepted them as they are. Do we need a vote on those as are? I, I think we decided we didn't. No. No. Do. Yes. Yes. No, for ones that just remain the same? Well, to be technically correct, a vote to accept the re recommendation of the policy subcommittee to accept them as written is perfectly in order. We never used to do that. <laughs> well, we've done it both ways. Both ways. And um, I have to agree. Way. Well, these things are, as long as you don't change it, it's, but if you want, we, what we want to be able to do is to note on the, on the policy that it was reviewed, even if it's not changed, that it was reviewed at this date. And for us to do that, you do need to take a vote. Would you like okay. to do that now or under new business? For, um, I think for expediency, why don't we do it now? Right. Do it now? Um, I'd like to make a motion then that we accept um, the policies I just listed. Um, as reviewed and accepted as is for September in September 1994. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Seven down. This is just getting too bureaucratic for words. Sorry. No. <laughs> and I guess I just continue. We will have some first readings, and the, um, we deleted some wording on policy AE goals of education and substituted and already accepted um, the board's. Um, mission and vision statement. And um, I'm assuming, do we need a vote on that one also? It's already an accepted. You are replacing yeah. wording, so it's. Mm -hmm. We do need a vote on that one? Because mm -hmm. you're replacing wording. Let's be consistent. OK. Um, I'd like to make a motion that in policy AE, goals of education, we um, replace the wording with our already accepted mission and vision statement. Okay. Any discussion? Charlie? Has all the board members read that mission? Well, it's part of our goal-setting okay. process. Right. I just want to make sure everybody has read it before. They, okay. Well, that was already accepted by the previous so, board. Right. And uh, but we probably should clarify that there is going to be a process for reviewing that. As Connie pointed out, by next spring, it will be four years old, and it would be appropriate to review it in any way. Um, so. OK, all in favor? And zero. Um, the change of wording in administrative guideline number 19, I assume we don't have to vote on because it is right. an administrative it's guideline. Just, uh, and we will do the first readings under new business. We will meet again on uh, Wednesday, September 28th at 9.30 in the superintendent's office. Um, and we will be focusing on um, high school policies that need to be updated. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, moving on to unfinished business, school board goals for the 1994-95 school year. <coughs> you want to? Uh, just as an explanation in your packet, we put um, a really one sheet summary. I really, as you can see, did not change them significantly from what they have been since we met in July. I did try to tighten them up a little bit, uh, group them so that you could um, basically um, we can, if you adopt them as stated there, and I'm looking for mine, which has got to be right here somewhere. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> we have the original draft there. Um, again, for anybody who is listening, these kinds of things are a bit tedious if you can't, don't know what we're talking about. Uh, the major goals are divided really into three uh, categories, managing the business, improving relationships, and working on curriculum. And beneath each of those major uh, areas, we have sub-goals, for instance, under managing the business, renovation, construction project. Clearly, that is a major issue for us this year. Uh, and we have some sub-goals within that. Continue the work of improving the budget process. We certainly realize we have new board members. We're going to have a workshop later in September. Um, 
and plan to have another one in October to facilitate um, planning and background and understanding of that and so forth. Um, and also finish the review of the policy manual, um, and I think really we're going to make very good progress on that one. The improving relationships, we've talked quite a bit in the last two or three years, beginning I think with our, the year we had a diversity committee, about uh, how essential it is to have positive relationships between school, parents, community at large. Uh, so we, we have some suggestions for team building exercises. And we also uh, regard the staff development that we're encouraging on differentiated curriculum, various other kinds of things, as actually a means to team building and relationships, better communication with parents, and so forth. Uh, and then under curriculum, uh, there are a number of issues, and in my notes that were some that in which I summarized the discussions we had in our August workshops. I go into more detail as to some of the suggestions administrators have made as to what we see as feasible um, to be done. But just to, for instance, tomorrow we have another meeting of our technology group, um, and it is coming along very well. I think we really will develop a five-year technology plan. We mentioned earlier today, it's really under managing the business, a five-year maintenance plan that it's also moving along. Um, and curriculum review is somewhat at different phases. For instance, math and foreign language uh, have been reviewed in a number of ways now, and the direction is set. It's a matter of monitoring. Um, we want to pick up and continue our K-12 reading committee that we started last year, and as part of that, develop a coherent system-wide research strand, and we uh, actually had the first um, steps taken to establish K-12 science committee. Thank you. Okay, Charlie. Before I leave this board, and I would mm -hmm. like to see them added as, as a curriculum uh, goal of the board, is to establish a K-12 social studies committee. Yeah. And the reason I'm really emphasizing this is we have an opportunity with two new social studies um, teachers in the high school with some new and, and in, you know, some new blood or whatever you want to call it to start to do some, some changes system-wide. And the only reason I'm alluding to it is looking at the 11th grade assess, um, MEAs, one of the areas which alarmed me a little bit, and I, and I talked to the social studies um, um, department head last night and a little bit with uh, the guidance director, and that was the area in social studies that we seemed to, to score the lowest in 11th grade was main study. Mm -hmm. yes. and, you know, and, and that is to some degree covered in 8th grade. So I think we start, we really do need to start looking at making social studies um, interesting and enlightening to students and that, that it's not something always put on the back burner. Because we are a very social, global world and until children realize there's something outside of Cape Elizabeth that, that we are very, and, and communications has made us even more of a global world. So I really would like to add that. Uh, I, I, I agree with you. And in fact, you know, social studies is the place you can do all that stuff about government and being a good citizen. And you can incorporate all those things that we really need to do from a very early age. I, we, I do think it's yeah. an area. We talk about respect it. and those kind of issues, which are social issues, which can also come under social studies. Yeah, in a context. In a context. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Any other suggestions about the goals? Okay. Um, was there a consensus that you'd like to add that committee? Does everybody feel comfortable mm -hmm. with that? Okay. okay. Well, then I think we should vote on them, and then I have a suggestion as to how we might proceed with them. So I'd entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we accept the school board goals for the 94-95 school year as presented with the addition of the K-12 Social Studies Committee. I second that. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? 7-0. OK, you know, when we look through this, obviously things are being done on a lot of these on an ongoing basis. And um, there, there are two things I'd like to see done. Um, first of all, I think we need to have some kind of chart so we can mm -hmm. kind of keep track of where we are with these things, because it's very hard. You know, I look at this and I say, well, we've done this and this. I think it would be helpful to all of us if we just had a chart so we could keep track of where we are. Um, I was also going to suggest that in terms of going forward, obviously, um, I, this memo was excellent in terms of 
the discussion with the administrators and there doesn't appear to be a lot of dissent as far as working on these goals. But I think um, it might be helpful if we could now meet again, or some of us, um, maybe at one of the administrative council sure. meetings or some other forum, so we could talk about timelines, um, who's responsible for what, reporting mechanisms back to the board, um, that kind of thing, what we can do to help and facilitate. I think it would be. I think we'd welcome that. Yeah, I think that would be good. So if we could set that up sometime fairly promptly. Okay. That would be great. Very Any good. other comments on the goals? Charlie? But just to, to reiterate, um, especially the involvement with the Administrative Council, I found those times when I've attended an Administrative Council meeting to be very effective yes. and informative and um, learning experience. And, uh, I think it helps communication. You're all welcome. Anytime. Uh, by the way, this year, um, we, last year we tried to meet um, on a schedule that frequently got pushed out of whack by one, for one reason or another. Uh, this year I'm determined to try to be more rigid about how we meet. But we meet with the building administrators on the first and third Fridays. And I'm also meeting on the second and fourth Fridays with what we're calling the support services administrative team. If we have a fifth Friday, a couple times we've had everybody meeting together. And um, some of us meet with both groups. For instance, Scott and I uh, and Sue Weatherby meet with both groups. So it's sort of an automatic bridge back and forth. And the support services would be maintenance, custodial, transportation, um, and uh, usually a uh, representative from the cafeteria. So we find that that kind of thing is, is helpful. But you're welcome to either one. Okay, moving on to new business. The first is first reading of policies. So, Beth, would you like to? Um, sure. This? Um, the policies for the first reading by the school board are IGBI, Foreign Language Homestay Program. That's the old name. Is that? That's how I officially read them, I guess. Um, not the changes, and they do not need to be read, do they? Or they do. Um, maybe we should just stop at each one so that people can, if they have any questions. Um, can I, Charlie? Does the rest does the rest of the board understand what happens with the first and second reading of a new policy? First reading is just to add any comment or question anything or. Okay. Um, are there any comments or questions on IGBI, um, which would be the foreign exchange student program? Uh, the second policy for a first reading is IGD, which is the co-curricular and extracurricular programs. Any questions? Um, then there is JFCC, which is student conduct on school buses. Um, there's an administrative guideline, JFCCR, that we are making um, a few changes to. That does not need a first reading and vote, since it's a guideline, I think. We have policy um, JO, student education records policy. We have AFCB, which is the teacher evaluation. We have BDDC, which is the agenda preparation and dissemination. Any questions, comments? And we have um, file BF, which is board policy development. No questions or comments? An old policy. What? 1984. Mm. A lot of old policies. Mm -hmm. That is an old one, though. Mm. Okay. Well, okay. then, I guess these come back for a second reading next month if they know. 
I'd just like to um, comment, too, that another administrative guideline, number 19, religious holidays, we made um, just a few wording changes. Um, but again, that doesn't need a first reading or to be voted on because it is an administrative guideline. And that's in your packet also. Thank you. I have a question, but not on the, on the policy. It's only because the foreign student program sparked the question. Do we have any exchange students this year? students. In fact, we're having a, a luncheon Friday with uh, Bill Brewington is our cultural exchange advisor. And we're setting up days for each of the students to present to, to our, uh, our students. Uh, so those five students are with us for, from the year. I can't tell you exactly what <laughs> we have someone from Spain, someone from Mexico, uh, two, two young men from Thailand, I believe, and, and one from Norway. Yeah. So, and then we're also, um, Judy Liberty is having, oh, we're having eight students from Spain come over just for a short period of time, not exchange students. So we're, we're doing some cultural exchange with, uh, with those students. And then uh, Judy Liberty will be presenting a, a program with where we go up to, to uh, Canada and some, some Cana uh, French students from Canada will be coming down in February. So but we have five exchange students who are here for the year. We had French students visit last year. Yes. Every other year. At yes, every other year. I'm yeah. sorry. So, okay. Okay. All right, moving on to the next item, approval to receive and spend all federal and state grants for the 1994-95 school year. It may seem a little strange that you have to take a vote to spend money that's given to us by somebody other than the local taxpayer. But that is the regulation you know, included in your packet. Primarily, we're talking about Chapter 2, drug-free grant, Title II, Eisenhower grant funds, and then under special, mostly special education issues, Chapter 1, which is not, strictly speaking, special education, but does, in our office, uh, is handled by that uh, uh, department, local entitlement, and follow the child. You have the numbers given, and you could take one vote to cover all of those, if you have any questions, we'll try to answer them. I think we've, those again, who are, people have been on the board understand that this is a, uh, a necessary step, but at the same time, um, I do expect you to probably accept the money. <laughs> Maybe with some questions. So. The, the drug-free grant funds, uh, how those dispersed have, are determined by a non-school board body. We accept the funds, but the funding uh, how it's dispersed, who is taking that responsibility? It used to be the coalition, the coalition has taken over. Okay. Yeah. It used to be the community team, and right, the, there was right. a period of time when it was inactive. And right. For instance, those, I believe that we used some of those funds for the survey, didn't we, Rick? Yes. Yeah. I mean, that was a combined middle school, high school, and uh, input from coalition decision. Do, are, are these funds prospective, meaning have we already earmark them for some particular cause? You mean the drug-free grant? Right, or? Well, there are certain programs that they've been supporting, uh, Quest for one, uh, or some training for Quest. I think we have the materials for Quest. I know Lyle Kramer has been working on that, and I believe he has a proposal that he's going to present to the coalition tomorrow night at their meeting um, about how to expend this year's monies. Um, given given the situation we're in with this survey and the possibility of looking at our in-school programs, do we have any power to ask them to please wait a little bit while we try to sort out? Because, you know, we may have some opportunities to work with the coalition on some program. I don't have anything particular in mind right now, but, um, or, or do we just have to turn it over to them? Is it Lyle who makes the recommendation to them as to how the money is spent? I don't know the precise answer to that. I know that um, in Lyle's preparation for his presentation to the coalition, he contacted all of us and needed to know specifically from us um, prior to tomorrow's meeting exactly how we would <coughs> like to spend that money so that it isn't that you can have a sum of money to be spent later. There is some, but you can't leave, leave a large sum. It, that's what it appears in the process that he's using with us. You can't carry it over from year to year. You lose it. And that affects your right. funding for the next year, but it's the coalition that determines 
and votes on how it's to be dispersed. But on the recommendation of the school, right. of the right. schools. Right. Well, that's why I'm wondering where, where the school board might be able to, you know, insert itself in that if we see a particular direction. I think why I would be open, go. or the coalition would be open to any suggestions we have. It helps sub, uh, the um, money from, from the grant also helps subsidize our freshman retreat. That, right. they, that takes a big piece of our, of, mm, right. of our need, right. as well as a sophomore day. And uh, as Nancy alluded to, as far as Lyle coming to us, how would you like to use that? One of the things Lyle did make, make evident to us is th that the monies will not be as much as they had been in the past due to funding decreases. So um, we're not expecting, even though we, we seem to have more avenues for, for attempting to use uh, use that money, it's, it's, we may find ourselves with less money to work with this year. Right, I'm just, you know, my point obviously is that if we're maybe doing some things, and I'm not pointing at any particular program, but I mean, if we're looking at the whole drug education issue as a system, um, I, I think we need to do that, is yeah. what I'm saying. And I had talked to Connie yesterday about somehow getting, getting a handle on what exactly, you know, a big list of the, all the programs we have in place that are, uh, you know, dealing with this issue where, you know, where the money's coming from, who's working on them, and, and just looking at it as an overview because we have quite a patchwork of, of things going on right now. I think this is an excellent op That's opportunity to start doing that. And, and, and again, for us to, to look at it system-wide, not just what a high school needs, middle school needs, but right. what our needs going to be for the year and have Lyle part of that discussion with yep. the board. I think okay. that, that would be very valuable. Part of the process for all of these grants is filling out a form in advance telling how you intend to spend the money. Right. So that that is a necessary process, even from the standpoint of those that are ongoing, like local entitlement, chapter one, and so forth. Uh, and that is part of the process that Lyle is following here. However, most of these, and I believe that one also, once you have uh, submitted it and followed their various, um, you know, uh, requirements for uh, assurances of the way in which you're going to use the money and so forth, once you filed it, if in fact you have a, a, a change in plans, all that's usually required is a substantiation, the process you used and what they would be. So the, uh, the, these grants are kind of clumsy because they are on a different timeline right. and also um, with many, many different guidelines from our regular budget right. issues. So it gets a little, but I think there's always room for a discussion and input. <clears throat> Oh, I should also mention that in my discussion with Dave Pickering, the, uh, I guess it's that omnibus crime bill that was passed is going to bring money into the state for some kind of purposes that he seemed to think might be tied to the, the our discussion was on the drug and alcohol. Right. I have no idea at this point what, but that would be an ongoing um, issue to look at. Well, I think I, I think we need to get all the players in talking about yeah. about these things and first seeing what we're, you know, all the things we're doing and then seeing if if it's time to re uh, channel some of these funds. I'm not saying right this minute, but but that that ominous um, bill that was passed actually is providing more social intervention help than actually police prevention help. Yeah, that was the impression I had. I didn't know. So that but, might be an yeah. avenue, too, for yeah, right. acquiring a, uh, a drug abuse or right. substance abuse right. counselor. Right. Okay. Well, I didn't attain a motion. Um, yeah. I'd like to make a motion that we approve um, or that we receive and spend all federal and state grants for the 94-95 year. Would you like them listed? No. No. Can you say as submitted? As submitted. Is there a second? Second. Charlie. Any discussion? All in favor? 7-0. Okay. Uh, moving on for personnel requests. We have a resignation. I put a um, piece in your packet. Nancy Antwistle has been a part-time speech therapist with us. Um, it has decided to devote more time to private practice. We are not hiring a specific replacement because we've been able to reassign students. So there is a resignation, but no uh, corresponding um, new hire. Um, then we have two requests here for um, changes in teaching assignment, reduction in one case to half time for the rest of the school year for Mary Grubel. Uh, as I explained in your note, she intended that her assignment then would be the reading recovery, which she's doing half time and the other half time would be chapter one 
should you grant her a request, you would be, we would be um, looking for a replacement for halftime chapter one work. And the second request you have for uh, an unpaid leave of absence beginning in December from Kristen Eames, who is intending to complete her master's program. Um, she did, in fact, originally request from December to December. It is my belief that uh, our policies um, make it necessary for you to deal with this on separate year bases. In other words, you, if you wish to grant the request, you would be granting it for uh, the remainder of this year from December to June. Should she wish to make a further request for next year, she would be submitting that by March and you would then be reconsidering it uh, on a year-to-year -year basis, which is the way we do these things. Okay, can we, we can take these all together. You can, right. if you wish. Okay. Just go ahead, Carla. <laughs> <laughs> could I make a motion that we accept the resignation of Nancy and Whistle and grant the request for half-time unpaid leave of absence for Mary Gravel and a half year leave of absence December to June for Kristen Eames, all as requested. I second that. John, any discussion? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, is on uh, Kristen Ames, Eames, is there any commitment on her part to come back to us if we do this or could she just resign? Well, I'd like to see her come back after she gets this degree. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, the, all of our procedures, protocols, and so on certainly um, expect that. Um, and it is an investment in a sense that the board is making by holding a, mm -hmm. a teaching slot open. Uh, the reality is there is no real um, hold. Uh, you cannot force people to come back, and if choices are made, frankly, I think those are always the kinds of times when people should make a choice and not be forced. We don't want to force the teacher in the classroom if that's not where they want to be. Um, so, but even over and above that, there really is no legal. So we hire then just for six months? And you mean hire replacement? Yes. Yes, we would be hiring a um, replacement to finish out this year. This is, of course, a procedure in our business, if you will. We have pregnancy leaves, we have childcare leaves, we have extended illnesses. It is not something that doesn't happen. We have pretty good procedures for dealing with that. We have a policy that talks about qualifications. Although this field is somewhat, it certainly are fewer candidates in the phys ed field than there are in some of the other fields, um, but we would not anticipate not being able to cover it uh, satisfactorily. She has been with us for some time. Yeah. Nine years. Nine years. Yeah. And she is also at the, in, the, in the realm of at the top of the pay scale. So it would not surprise me that she would not come back to us. Yeah. It's a risk you take. Rick. I'd just like to add, she's real enthusiastic about this program that she is in. Uh, and looks forward, to, in, in my talking with her, is looking forward to completing that and then coming back with some new and fresh ideas. So I, I think her intention at this point is very much so to come back to Cape Elizabeth and, and continue her teaching career here. But she's, uh, she's begun this master's program, which requires her to travel uh, because it's a humane uh, Orono program. She's been traveling to Waterville, Augusta, and this would give her the opportunity to take, take some classes and not have to worry about travel and, and that sort of thing. So she's real enthusiastic about that, has come back with some great ideas. So again, I think her intention is uh, very forthright in the idea of completing that master's degree and, and continuing at Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we should stress this is an unpaid leave. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, she's not asking for any kind of paid, paid leave. And I, I do think we want to be in the position of encouraging our teachers certainly to further their right. education. That's certainly, you know, certainly to our benefit. I think the, I know the only time I've been, you know, a little hesitant is if we've had someone here for a, you know, for a very short time and, you know, they, they haven't demonstrated, you know, a commitment yet to, to our system. Um, the, those are the times when I've, I've personally had reservations. And we have someone now out on a year's leave of unpaid, of absence and that is Mrs. Wiley who's right. you know going for her masters, completing her masters. So 
again, you take you take a chance. Well, it would be you, good to encourage it. Yes. Yeah. To take them one case at a time, yeah. I think. That's why we vote on them. But, okay, where well, that was the discussion. All in favor? <laughs> Seven zero. Okay, the next item is nominations for athletic fee coaching positions for 1994-95. I want to take the co-curricular as well. Yes, you might as well. Uh, and under co-curricular, I'll be adding Barbara Kelly uh, under the high school as theater assistant. That's a position she has held before. Uh, so just to read the list, nominations for athletic coaching positions. Seventh grade girls soccer, Todd Peterman. Eighth grade girls soccer, there's a change from Joellen Rand to Roy Dunphy. Seventh grade boys soccer, Jeff Torek. Seventh grade field hockey, Ann St. John. Uh, freshman boys soccer is a change from Kurt McCandless to Martin Keene. Under co-curricular positions, team leader in English, Sally Martin. Team leader in social studies, Ray Cooper. Chem safe coordinator, Pat Monterio. And as I said, theater assistant, Barbara Kelly. The middle school, chorus 5-6, Rebecca Wing. Math 5-6, Gary Record and Steve Conley, and at Pond Cove, team leader grade two, Dottie Anderson. Charlie? Just an explanation, what is Math 5-6? Uh, you want to explain that, Nancy? There are a few opportunities for our fifth and sixth grade students to meet with other fifth and grade student, fifth and sixth grade students from other middle schools to compete in a similar fashion to what they do with the seventh and eighth grade math team. However, what Steve and Gary also offer is an opportunity for those students who really enjoy working in mathematics to meet every so often after school and to solve different problems together and investigate different things in mathematics. So you would classify this as a team? It's, it's one of our co-curricular non-athletic fee positions, yes. Okay. 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 I'd entertain the motion. Beth? I'd like to make a motion that we accept the nominations for athletic fee coaching positions, 94-95, and the co-curricular positions for 94-95 as presented with the addition of the theater assistant, Barbara Kelly. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Seven zero. And having come to the end of our agenda, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. I just have one comment, and that on the dates to remember on the back of our agenda, I think oh, the yeah. finance committee for Tuesday, October eleventh, was changed to six o'clock instead that is of six correct. thirty. That is right. like a workshop. Then I'll make a motion that we adjourn. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Seven zero.